on this episode of Rebel Spirit Radio. There are not all, not this, but there are many tribes from the Amazon to Alaska that practice forms of the ghost dance. So I believe it's not the property of anybody, but it's inherent in the earth of America with the leadership of these people to bring us all together because no one's going to do it for us. We're going to have to get down and get our hands dirty and do it ourselves. And if you're sitting around hoping if these guys are going to do it for us or these mm. ladies, good luck, because I don't have a second belief they're going to come through. But I do believe in people. I do believe in the ghost dance, and I do believe in Mother Nature. Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, author and documentary filmmaker Michael Stewart Ani joins me to discuss his book, The Ghost Dance, An Untold History of the Americas. In a wide-ranging conversation, Michael discusses his experience of living with the Yanomami, his interactions with Carlos Castaneda and Timothy Leary, why commercialization of plant medicines is another form of colonialism, and of course, the ghost dance. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. From 1988 to 2002, after many years of jungle training, Michael Stewart Ani and his Amazonia Foundation became a central part of a medical outreach program introduced to fight the epidemics among the Yanomami tribe of Venezuela. In 1992, Michael won the Best of Festival from the U.S. Environmental Film Festival for Yanomami, Keepers of the Flame, which is about the struggle to stop the epidemics. For his efforts, Michael was made a member of the Explorers Club. He later directed a documentary for the Catalina Island Conservancy entitled Going Home, which told the story of the repatriation of some of the last genetically pure American bison to the Lakota people. Ani lived in Mexico's remote Sierra Mazateca region of Huaca from the end of the 1960s to the 1970s and is the only outsider to have ever been allowed into the sacred cloud forests. He still returns to visit with his Mazatecan community to this day. Over the last 50 years, he has followed the rope of the dead from the tribes of the Amazon rainforest to the tribes of North America, tracking the missing steps of the ghost dance along the way. He joins me today to discuss his book, The Ghost Dance, An Untold History of the Americas. Michael, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you, Nick. Well, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed your book, The Ghost Dance. I loved the way it was written. It, and to be honest, it made me feel a little bit embarrassed by my lack of knowledge uh, about the history of the indigenous Americans. And, you know, I knew some of it, but your telling of it was very mythic and profound, I think. Uh, so I really appreciated it. You know, the way I wrote the book, on purpose I did, I wrote it in the style of the pre-Columbian codices. Mm. And I did that because the story comes from that. Right. And I felt it was a little bit of a different way to do it, but it really set it up from its origins with mostly the Codes Borgias and the Codes Mistakas. Ah, wonderful. Yeah. The one of them, that's one of the only, or are they both the only like fully intact codices that we still have? Well, interesting enough, the great H.B. Um, Nicholson, who was my dear friend, who was called the grandfather of Aztec studies, his big work was he realized that part of the Codex Mistecas and the Codex Borges were actually once the same book. Mm. And they were split in half for sale to through the popes, the Spanish popes at the time, the Borgia and Spanish popes in Spain. And why they, when you put them together, it changes everything is because the Codex Borgia is, is literally like the, the last true holy book of the Americas. 
in the way that it literally shows the opening of all the medicine bundles in all the different rituals. Mm. And the Codex Mistakers are the books where Gordon Watson actually found the images of the actual, the only recorded images of an actual pre-Columbian mushroom rituals. Oh, so wow. if you put both books together, you've got the actual ritual and the events that take place in the supernatural world because of the ritual. And that's very key to what I write about and talk about because how I've come up with my opinions and insight is I'm maybe the last person alive or very few that actually lived with truly uncontacted tribes, completely naked tribes, pre-stone, pre-metal, but evolved like all people. But I did get an insight into what the people were really like and how they viewed their spiritual world without any outside bastardization or reworking. They had no idea of chicanery or trickery. It's truly what they were. So I took that and my knowledge of reading pre-Columbian um, pictographs and then just the years and also my work with the what I call the talking plants, which is what I believe is the source where the ancient indigenous people of the Americas got their knowledge. And for whatever reason, I was allowed to tap into the same source. So between the plants being able to read pictographs, pre-Columbian pictographs, and living in, I'm saying this very generally, pre-Columbian times, that's how I formed my theories. So can you say a little bit about how you ended up living among the tribes? What what was that it's, journey? It's a great, you know, I hear all these spiritual stories and people finding the light and going here. My story was nothing like that. It was wacky mistakes and happenstance. I mean, I had major death in my family as a young boy. So I went into kind of pre midlife crisis in, in my teens dealing with death. And I ended up in Mexico and kind of going reverse in the story, how I really, I had been with the Yanomami once before in Brazil, but how I got into the Yanomami in Venezuela was I was hired by Aaron Spelling to make a movie in the Amazon called Wizard of the Upper Amazon about Manuel Cordova Diaz, who is the person who really brought ayahuasca and everything to the outside world without a question. His book is Wizard of the Upper Amazon. And when I got to put Ayacucho in Venezuela, it just happened that in this little tiny theater, the police, one of the police academy movies was playing. And I had a full screen credit on that movie. And immediately everybody in town believed I dated Marilyn Monroe for years, right? <laughs> so ah, not quite the truth. But because of that and them opening up to me and me spending most of my life in that world, I got very taken in. You know, the mayor, the future governor were my friends. The head of the military was my hunting and fishing partner. And then I got into in a very interesting position because of the local government before it had become a state had so much made me their guy that when it became a state of Amazonas, the federal government went along and put me in the position where I became one of the few people on earth, which, which was called, quote, the Orinoco Wild Bunch. I was one of a very small group of people that had presidential permission to be with uncontacted tribes. And the reason wasn't because of that. The reason was another coincidence. The president Perez at the time flew over Yanomami country when the epidemic started and the Yanomami were all chanting, Mikey, Mikey, Napo, Napo, Siki, Bruca, Chapuri. And he said, what's that? What's a Mikey? And the pilot said, I know Mikey, you want to meet Mikey? <laughs> And I met the president and I became more or less the main guy in charge of that part of it. And that went on. 
I thought I would fight that epidemic for a year. This is an insight for everyone on virgin soil. That epidemic raged for more than 12 to 14 years. Epidemics don't go away if you mishandle them. Yeah. And we know all about mishandling <laughs> that. I'm not talking yeah. vaccines or any of that one way or another. But the protocol right. was almost non-existent by scientific standard. Yeah. And what was the uh, epidemic at the at the time? Well, what happened with the Yanomami is exactly what happened to the Yanomami under Jean Bolsonaro in Brazil. And it started in Brazil then, too. They put out lots of misinformation. They told stories that there's these poor Garamperos gold miners who have nothing and nowhere to go. And they've just flooded into the jungles and there's nothing the government can do. Well, from a guy who's lived a lot of time out there, I'll tell you, you can't get up there with mining equipment without DC-3s or helicopters. They had big money behind them from mm. the beginning. Mm. It was all a lie. Mm. And it came over the border from Brazil into Venezuela. And for whatever reason, the Venezuelan government got very behind me to wage a fight. And with everything I had, I ended up getting spinal malaria. And I mean, I went through my own ride. But mm -hmm. it, um, it was quite a fight. And in the end, a friend of mine who comes from a very powerful medical family background, a fellow was extremely famous scientist. We came up with Artemisia Nua, an herb from from China and why we were having 10 to 12 percent success with the millions of dollars of pharmaceuticals that was donated to the Amazonia Foundation we didn't get any grip until we went through with the Artemisia which we rated had somewhat near an 87 percent rate of curing among not only malaria which we got it for but dengue fever ASCO Sinosis, schizomaniosis, many diseases. And that's why I'm very much, I've through COVID went through many pueblos, especially Mexico, in old Mexico, right. and dealt with many people dying with the Artemisia. And firsthand, it worked. Wow. And even the World Health Organization, referring to the Max Planck Institute in the Institute of um, research hospital in Mexico City, um, they did say, yes, they recognize that Artemisia nua does have a very high rate against malaria, but they claimed that because they were worried about a very big malaria breakout, if it got used, they said, we can't use it. I saw that as a very racist comment because mm -hmm. I'm in the field and most people in the third field that were very sick like this, already had dengue fever or malaria <laughs> and this stuff. So it was the perfect plan, but you just can't make big bucks on it because mm -hmm. it's a plant. Gates went and he had um, a synthetic version of one compound of it, Artemisian made, which he married together with hydrochloroquine to become the world health standard. He was warned very strongly at the time that by marrying it with a synthetic drug that the parasite already knows, that it's gonna figure it out. Mm. So I felt that is a very bad excuse. And I am still a believer that one of the keys to human survival of what we're going through. And I've worked with vaccine programs, all kinds of medical programs. I'm, everyone's an individual. And all the people are individuals. I can't make a blank statement out of any of it. But I do believe plants like Artemisia new are key to mm. the survival of the human species. Mm. Well, it's fascinating to me that uh, you said that this was a Chinese herb. Yeah. What's interesting is that the Amazon is known for all the healing plants there. And you know, it's just kind of ironic in a sense that it's something that came from China that could help rather than from the Amazon. Not ironic though. Great point, Nick, but not yeah. ironic because yeah. malaria is not indigenous to the yeah. Americas. Uh, it was brought over here by the conquistadors with the mm. slave. So we're dealing with a plant that came from where the disease originated. Oh, okay. And not to say... I know there have been certain tribes that have come up with local plants 
that served them very well mm. through the pandemic. So there are things, there's never just one thing. Right, right. But this is the one I happen to right. find out about and use. I'm sure there's medicine people out there that got all kinds of variations. Some of those people are so astute at what they do, it's mind boggling. Right, right, for sure. So uh, I'm I'm curious still about your experience with the tribes and you begin the book by describing a ritual where you are eating the little ones, which are sort of the sacred mushrooms. And what steps did it take to get you there? I mean, did you have to get the trust of the villagers, I would imagine? What was that journey like? Once again, much more crazy happenstance and odd things than anything woo-woo wonderful. But somehow I don't get that. So other people <laughs> might. Somehow that ain't the way my game goes. What happened with me was my brother had been murdered. I had family death. I was in a bad place. I was really kind of emotionally destroyed. And I was down uh, in Mexico. And... I just got off the main path somehow. A Cuban, uh, Cubano refugee gave me a map on it. It was like a Taco Bell napkin <laughs> of where this supposed treasure was. And me and this other cowboy from Texas, we said, no, no enlightenment, no becoming Bodhisattva. We were like, let's go find treasure, right? And we went out there and he didn't last. But I kind of really got into it. And the people there were very dangerous. It was not this, you know, that's the interesting thing about the specific sacred mushroom. The mushrooms that are being toted in the United States and worldwide, not saying they don't have marvelous qualities, but they are not the sacred mushroom of the Masa mm -hmm. tech, which is called Tishito. They are other species of mushrooms and none of these people who claim to have all this knowledge and all, I don't know any of them that have ever seen, know, or aware of these exist in anything. Because my guess is my guess that most of the mushrooms that have popped up, uh, magic mushrooms in Oregon and Washington, actually popped up around municipal buildings in the wood chips. And my guess is they probably spores came on the pants of people from the United States who'd gone down in areas and came back. Because mm -hmm. no matter what they try to portray, in the Masateka, there is tons of historic reference to Dishitu within the living culture, within the codices, temples, everything. In, in Oregon, in Washington, there is no indigenous reference. And because I've lived more than most of my life with indigenous people, I know them. And there is not one elbow on an insect that they don't have a name for. <laughs> if it exists in their world, believe me, they know about got a name in a rap on it, whether correct or not. They're incredibly, as I always joke about the Amazon, People go, well, what are the people like? They're ignorant. They don't have our science. I laugh and go, to survive in the Amazon, you got to be a genius because if you're not, you're a dead Indian. <laughs> you know, you can't survive. Any dumb Indian in the Amazon is a dead Indian. You got to be very smart every day to survive out there. And in their world, these people are incredibly aware to a level we don't even understand. Yeah. So yeah. I got down there. And when I got there, I ended up marrying a girl. I ended up being a slave for her grandfather. And then they told me all these rules I had to have. And then at one point, out of nowhere, Carlos Castaneda showed up. Mm. And and he's sitting there with the old turtle in Hanaro, and he's bringing them beer and mezcal in there. And their English was worthless, to say the least. They spoke Mazatec. Their Spanish was pretty much worthless. But they had an interpreter and my wife. And, and I got so furious with them that they make me work like a slave. And here for some beer and mezcal, they're giving everything away to this guy. They don't even know I'm married to his granddaughter. 
And the old turtle looks at me and goes, you're an idiot. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks. You know, he said, have you ever seen one other person go into Chico Nindo's forest? Have you ever seen one person we didn't kill that tried to meet the DC too? So shut up and get back to work. <laughs> and then I realized it. I was in an extremely unique position. And at that point, I had eaten, you know, I had eaten different mushrooms in San Jose, Del Pacifico, different South America. And I had interesting effects, but nothing staggering. You know, I was aware of psychedelics. I was never a big, I've never been pretty a drug guy who takes a lot of stuff. Just I, if I did that in the jungle, I'd be dead. I, I was more into surviving and the jungle was my thing. But at one point, I was given a particular, very different looking mushroom, very different thing. And when I ate those in ritual, I realized I had gone away from where I consider Western man has been stuck since not the 60s, since the 20s, when really the first psychedelic revolution started in Berlin with the discovery and synthesization of mescaline. And what I saw was there is an extreme difference between a hallucination and a vision. They are not the same thing. And they have very different rules and things. Them. And so I had a visionary experience. And the other funny thing I learned through Carlos Castaneda, who I knew fairly well, hmm. was the whole concept of going and finding butterfly woman in Santa Fe and being her apprentice in study with her. I assure you, from the Lakota to the Cree, through Mexico, South America, in the Pan-American indigenous belief system, there is no apprenticeship. That was made up by Carlos, just like he made up the name Mescalito. In Mexico, Mescalito is a shot of mezcal. And, <laughs> and I hear people going, oh, we're singing traditional huichol mezcal songs, mezcalito. No, they don't call them mezcalito. That's a bunch of white people did that one. <laughs> so I started to see through the veil of illusion. Mm. And I entered into a very personal relationship. Only one in the outside world that's ever had it. And I know this because I've been there fairly a lot, almost over 60 years. Mm. So there's been a lot of changes in that time. And they allowed me to go and find them, which is very difficult. You got to find it by smell. Mm. And because it's dark in the forest where they grow. And they're very elusive. They've got much personality to themselves. And I also learned through them that if you don't, and this is where sometimes my wife chokes with me. She says, you know, people talk about, you know, people who were zealots and, you know, and Puritans about belief and all. I'm extremely hold to the traditions to an extreme, just for me. This mm -hmm. is, and I realize that in a ceremony, if every single thing is not exactly correct, the spirit will not come. Mm. It has to be at that exact moment when the animals of day go to sleep and then there's a second until those of, and everyone can notice this, go out in the woods and there is about matter of, may, I don't know, a minute or something, very short, where you don't hear the voices of the day animals anymore. You start to hear the night ones. And between that spot, that's where you can get through the easiest. Mm -hmm. I learned that you have to fast, you have to do that. The ceremony is only the middle of it where you actually do it, that the ritual takes place way before the ceremony and ends way after the ceremony. And this is why I very much struggle with this new monetary commercial. They call themselves psychonauts. I call them mm -hmm. psychonauts. <laughs> because I don't see any of them doing anything I learned in tradition with the Yanomami, right. the Piro, the Mekiratari, the Wambisa, the Miasate, the Lakandonis. They've just kind of made up their own thing. And right. not to say 
that does not have something because to be realistic, how many people could go with me into the jungle for months and even survive? Mm. You know, I get it. Different people have to come at different levels. But the big problem I find with 99% that I've met, and I've met a lot of them, is they don't know how to bring the initiate back down and put their feet on the ground solid. Typically after these psycho nut sessions, people are winged out and they get in this pattern where after the session and they're, thank God I'm alive and I've lost my mind. The next day they believe they're becoming a bodhisattva. The next day they head right towards a term I called enlightenment, <laughs> which is, thinking that the more Anglo white you are, the more aware and smart you are. And that's really what they do think. Enlightenment, not alignment, something else. <laughs> and then through the week, they start to have an emotional breakdown. They go back to being manic depression or schizophrenic or, you know, bipolar, whatever. Then they're suicidal by Thursday. By Friday, they do another one of these psychonut ceremonies and the next thing you know, they're on this endless wheel of believing they're a bodhisattva, of believing they're not worth anything because these plants and the chemical pharmaceutical extracts are so powerful, obviously, and so mind altering that you cannot treat them as a weekend party favor. It's not cannabis. Hmm. This stuff will rattle your brain and cannabis is strong, but this is a whole other thing. Right. And so I'm very watchful how that's unfolding in the United States because I'm seeing it head purely towards commerciality and not towards the true psychological and health aspects. And my next thing to it is, I know if people went out after listening to me and went to get all the peyote they could get or all the unguitos they can get, they'd be instinct in a year. There's hardly <laughs> enough for the native people. There's hardly, right. most of them are going, there's three varieties of addition to that are extinct already, extinct, right. right? Haven't seen them in 25, 30 years. So I know to help people with ailments of society, trauma, fear of death, cancer, all these things related to culture and civilization, of course, we have to develop these things, and I have great hope in them. But if we don't learn how to communicate with nature again through talking plants, which we've completely lost, none of us are going to be here in our niche to care about any of that stuff. So it's very interesting to me that the power forces seemingly in control of psychedelia today have, once again, like all colonists, colonial belief people throwing the important thing aside for what's going to put some tosqua in their little pocket and you know and i love the guy from um john hopkins said to me one day he said well you know we're being very careful and dealing with the right organization and people and we don't want to let the genie out of the bottle like that horrible timothy leary who was a dear friend of mine and i liked him thought he was genius i didn't think it was horrible he made plenty of mistakes he was human but he was an incredible guy. And I said to them, Chidi out of the bottle. Haven't you ever <laughs> heard of, you know, light in the bottle, of Lazapalooza, all these things? Kids are taking 36 different psychedelics a day. And then some of the people at these foundations, and I've gone to some of their events, but I wouldn't do it, are saying, oh, our scientists have figured out how you mix all these chemicals together and you take it with Valley Min Prozac so you don't have any of the weird effects. Well, I call those weird effects the ceremony and the ritual. And so what I see them doing is the last little remnant that thank God there is in these pharmaceuticals, these ding-dongs are thrown in the garbage because they're focused on money, not on the yeah. healing of yeah. Yeah. Whenever hedge fund managers get involved, one should always run the other way. Right. <laughs> to me, it's like, you know, I could just say it's simple. I'm off the map. I ain't yeah. on their map. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're silly people to me. Yeah. Well, but here's the question is the, uh, there's a lot that I want to ask you based on just what you had just said. So uh, we'll probably circle back a couple of times, but what is immediately to mind is I like the idea 
that you know we've we i don't like the idea that we've lost the ritual i like the idea of the importance of the ritual and i'm wondering what you think we can do to bring that back in because not everyone can go down to the amazon and learn from the teachers would it be a matter of listening to the plants well ah, you said it beautifully nick first of all it's all about listening to the plants that's why i call them talking plants um i have extensive knowledge of what's going on and coming out of the amazon and i've talked to many of the tatas and the different spiritual people up here bringing ayahuasca up in plastic soda bottles in my day if you cooked ayahuasca in an aluminum pot in the jungle or you put it in a plastic thing, people of village would kill you right then and there mm. and now they're going oh i've spoken to many of these kids and they're like oh you're from our grandfather's day but the plant has told us not to do that to play harmonica and do for the people like they want and all that i'm like well you're wearing your grandpa's kushma you're wearing a replica of his body necklace you're wearing his headdress but you don't want to listen to anything they told you well, more silliness for the silliness. So just going to people in the Amazon, far from assures that I was down in Pizac in um, Peru just a couple months ago. And for me, it was just an insane asylum with the doors open and a little bit better looking people. Hmm. You know, kids in the street blown out of their mind talking all this, this. No, 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 no. When I learned to do the plants, they made me learn all about the forest to an insane level before I ever could really do it. Because when you've learned the area and the plant snow that the plant lives with and you do it, it brings it all together. Hmm. When you're doing it all yourself, it's all my, me, I. And that's why in psychedelic art, we've been stuck since the 20s, definitely in the 60s, into this dripping colors, kaleidoscopy, crystalline, you know, transmutation of things. That's the carnival the plants used to keep the uninitiated away. We've been stuck there because we've never entered their world. I assure you this 100%, this isn't my opinion. There is a point you can go through that whole carnival and then you're truly in a visionary realm not a carnival light show, which is not the key to the plant. But what they're trying to sell us is that, you know, it's not the plant. I see those t-shirts at every event I go to with the DMT, LSD, MD. They got it all listed on their shirt. Really what they're saying in their own colonial word is the indigenous people that preserve this knowledge to us to a point where if they did it, none of us, including me, would know about it. It's not important because it's chemicals and nobody can, you know, own chemicals. So we'll put a couple darker skin faces in the room and go, look, everything's good. We're with them. Horseshit. Bunch of colonial bastards. Mm. Don't yeah. buy it. Yeah. So so what can be done? What, what, what can, what can be done people do? Yeah. Let's be realistic. The first time I took LSD was in 1965 when it was still legal on a Chuckles candy with a drop of Sandoz on it. Nobody was even making Gosleys and any of that stuff yet. Mm. And it blew, changed my whole life. I had no idea what I was walking into that night. You know, it was like beyond anything. People, when they try to tell the stories of the 60s, it's very hard because they can't get across how incredibly naive the world was. And when Timothy Leary went on the Isle of Brake show and told everyone, we've got God in a pill, we believed it. You know, many, many years later, I was with Tim Leary at John Lilly's house for his birthday. And I said to him, you know, Tim, you went down to, you know, Konohaki and Oaxaca and the mushrooms, and you that's how you wrote the psychedelic experience. No, why did you leave it behind and get on the India thing? Right, where the India starts. He said, No, that was Richard Alba's Baba Rum Raisin thing. That was me. He just gave them to me and I wore him. He said, But you got to remember, I was a scientist coming out of the age of chemistry. 
where we believe chemicals were going to fix everything in the world. And I said, yeah, Tim, but look what pesticide, it's those chemicals that are killing us. He said, well, I know a lot more now than I knew then. You know, very Tim Leary kind of comment and why I liked him because he was very childlike in that way. He would say what he felt. So what I say is, yes, I am 100% against it being illegal, whether I agree with it or not, because it doesn't work making it illegal. Right. It just puts it puts minority people in jail. Why white people get away with it? It does all kinds of bad stuff. So screw that. It should be legal. But my opinion is to heal the earth, we should have a council through the National Council of American Indians, which, by the way, I'm a part of. And we should have female elders of inter-American tribes, grandmothers. And they should be the ones who are saying it. And they should be the ones to get the first programs because there's no bigger drug problems than on reservations. The Lakota reservations, the reservations here in New Mexico, kids under 21, 90% of them are drug addicts at this point. Mm. It's worse than alcohol ever was. So indigenous grandmothers, should oversee it and not these people who are come from privileged white backgrounds that right. want to turn it into this big monkey dance so they can make millions and billions of dollars because why they're drug addicts and they've been taking drugs solid heroin cocaine marijuana this all through this stuff and i've been at their meetings and they go well because we're the ones who've taken so much of this stuff we deserve to be the ones to reap the profit. No, I don't feel that way. I think that will destroy things. I think putting it in the hands of indigenous people will be the closest thing to a white buffalo, a real one, any of mm. us are going to see. Because all these white buffaloes that get toted around here, not one of them's a buffalo. They're all beefalo. The yeah. only true white buffalo can come from part of that herd I brought to the Lakota from the Dechenchila, Right, mm -hmm. it must be born from white calf, white buffalo calf woman's herd. Mm -hmm. These are all buffalo that have um, cattle genes in them. They're beefalo. So there's so many levels of evolution here that if young people are going to have these experiences and then look for it, and I will say, from me, I would hope that I'm a person who can bring it to people that you know a more healthy way to do it how you can do it alone in your room but take lots of precautions so you don't set yourself on fire or hurt right. yourself you know i i know those things there are other people besides me that knows those things that's the way i would like to see it going than the way it's been heading this year which is to to another complete debacle disaster like happened with cannabis yeah if you notice the, all that amazing cannabis research, and I was involved in the epilepsy programs, we saw miracles in front of our eyes take place with children. If you've noticed, since it's gone recreational, you don't even hear about that. All right. those programs are dead that I know. And that's what they're going to try to do with psychedelics, because they're going to take control. But I have good news for everyone about that. <laughs> Yeah, which is the good news the good news is you got to take a lot of drugs to believe <laughs> that elon lilly pfizer and goddamn sandoz is going to give away a trillion dollar psychedelic business to a bunch of yo-yos from northern california and around that that ain't gonna happen so right. don't worry too much about these fools will trip on themselves yeah yeah, well, I, I love the idea of a council of uh, grandmothers. I think that is perfect and much needed. And I know that this summer, I don't know too much about it, but in Denver, there was a, it was the MAPS meeting, the Multidisciplinary mm -hmm. uh, Psychedelic Society, I think, Association of Psychedelic Studies. When the founder, Rick Goblin, was speaking, he was interrupted by a group of Native protesters. Yes. yes. Yeah. A few things about that. I found it very interesting. I got a great chuckle out of it. I liked it. I got to say, I'm glad I wasn't Rick because that woman had a louder, that native woman had a louder voice than Rick did with the microphone, you know, <laughs> 12,000 people. She had an incredible voice. You can yeah. hear everything. 
say, and I love one line she said, summed it up to me. Rick gave his standard pad answer, good answer. He said, well, I see some brown faces in the audience. She said, those are the tokens you planted because <laughs> even native people go, white people get the money, let's get next to them. You know, yeah. that's an, as old as the hills, that one. And I think that's very much, I think it's a sham against, I think it's an insult to indigenous people. And I don't quite understand how a tax exempt organization that donates money to institutes like John Hopkins is really behind the scenes trying to create a money corporation to take control over this stuff. And actually, I know at this point, other small people who are putting out psilocybin tablets or little things, they're going, oh, it doesn't fit our standards. I know those people. I've been around them. I don't know if they got the only standard I know they got is they really think driving Tesla's cars are going to save the world. Mm -hmm. And that's about as wacky as you can get. That ship sailed about 50 years ago. There's no reality. And those Tesla cars, there is worse polluting things on the earth and they run on lithium batteries, which is probably going to kill us all mining lithium. Worst thing you can do. So it's just illusions on illusions on more illusions on more illusions. And I really wish old Tim Leary was alive to point his finger at it because he would see it in the snap of a finger. And they're somehow getting away with it for a minute because most of the real old timers that are left are dead. <laughs> yeah. They're not old, you know. <laughs> you know. We got a couple left. We got a couple real people like Wade Davis, you know, who's right. very authentic and a great poet and writer, you know. But he's a scientist, Wade. Mm. He's not part of this money scheme. He's done very well just being the great anthropologist poet, Wade Davis. He don't need their horseshit. Right, right. Well, you know, you've mentioned this a couple of times, and it was one of the points I wanted to circle back around to, and that is the sense of an illusion, because in the book, you talk about the veil of illusion, and wasn't this connected to the Lord of the Witches, I think? Not the Lord of the Witches. You mean the War of the Witches? The, I had the Lord of the Witches, but I could be wrong. Well, the I Lord of the Witches, I got it what you're saying. Tetzcalipoca. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the Lord of Witches, the Lord of Illusion. Yeah. But interesting enough, in the ancient story, when Quetzalcoatl gets the seed of Hadishitu to get together with Zokchil Quetzal, the precious flower who had the ability to grow the first corn, which, by the way, first corn kernels ever found the oldest, 9,000 years old, are found in the moss to take in a cave. It all goes right to there where they dance the first ghost dance. His illusion was interesting because his brother, Quetzalcoatl, is the Lord who created civilization. So planting of corn, medicinal uses, art, music, the very good things, the the gems of civilization, in my opinion, right? But Tezcalipoco, who Westerns portrays like the devil or evil, he was so tied to Coquilicue, Mother Earth, that he saw civilization will ultimately destroy civilization in the fifth cycle, which is right now. And so he devised a ritual with his brother at that time. And as I say, the ghost dance was first danced by gods, not by any tribe in particular. And no tribe can say they own the ghost dance. That is just not true. You know, people say the Paiute people, Pope danced the ghost dance in New Mexico in 1680, long before long before Wavoka and the Paiute, not to say that the Paiute weren't amazing with their thing, but it's an illusion what's been created. And I believe we are under this incredible veil of illusion of Tezcalipoca, because I think now we're in a time where that onion's starting to unfold and peel, and the levels of illusion that we've been forced to believe in are outstanding and i'm going to just give a little funny taste of how 
kind of funny the whole thing is we all went to school and learned that a guy named Christopher Columbus came to the new world and he met dark brown skinned people and said, they're Indians from India. I'll call them Indians. Well, guess what? In 1492, there was no country named India. It was called Hindustan and the people were Hindustanis. So that's a complete lie. It's not true. They made that up and they named him Chris, Christopher Columbus. His name was Cristobal Colón. There's no such person, Christopher Columbus. They made up this whole thing to set a certain precedent of a people who didn't really own their culture and everything. When in fact, when the first padres came with, with Cristobal Colón, Columbus and Pizarro and Cortes and these people, when they met the people, they named them in Spanish, Indios, Dios, God in the image of God, because you got to remember in Europe at the time, people wore the big hats and the boots because they lived in human excrement. They threw it out the windows of England, in Paris and all those places. And disease was insane. People were rotten. They had no hygiene. It was beyond disgusting. They got to the new world and these people were healthy and robust and happy and didn't have plagues or anything. So, they really thought they were the, in the image of Dios. Quickly after Columbus, Cristobal Colón realized that because they really have a magnificent that way, you can enslave them because they weren't treacherous at first. So then came, let's make them Indians and let's rape and pillage and do everything we want. So we've been under giant illusions in so many ways. And of course, the biggest one for me is, let's face it, we all grew up and, oh, Native people are tree huggers. Oh, they're ignorant. They talk to plants. They live in the dirt. They're this or that. Well, guess what? In history, they're the right ones. Of course, in the short second of time of the Industrial Revolution, those developers, pro progress people, have just about destroyed the human niche in nature. And the indigenous people kept it going on for, I don't know, 50,000 years without a hitch. So I guess they were right. And maybe we can get past the illusion and get to that belief. But I do want to say this, like any people, I'm a person who does not believe races exist. I believe it's all inherent in the soil. You and I have stuff in common because we kind of live in the same soil, listen to the same music, kind of <laughs> eat the same food way more than some relative you've never seen in some strange piece of the world that you never meet. You meet him and go, I don't know this guy, right? Perfect. It's not that, I don't believe that. I believe it's the, it's in like the plume serpent is inherent in the earth mm -hmm. and all. And this is, the earth is our thing, the soil, it's our life. We can restore it. Mother nature has the most curative powers for herself in history. But at this point in history, I'm very sad to say what the last time I had ayahuasca told me that there is nobody of these people really doing anything that could help the planet. And there are really absolute simple ways that great mm -hmm. victories in the environment can be made. But because it's all based on how do I make a billion dollars on, on solar panels? How do I make a billion dollars on silly cars that I sell carbon credits for to the worst polluters in the world and make believe I'm in our environments? Instead of how do we use everything we have, everything. I've worked with the military. I've worked with governments. I have no rules. When you're in a fight to save the people, to save the land, you use every tool you have. You don't exclude anyone, any so-called differing group or race. We're all going to live or die together. And that's another problem I'm dealing with now with the part of the wokeness saying, yeah. oh, well, guess what? If the people in the United States, the indigenous people really got a foot up and started healing, but they said, Oh, you're not our tribe. So you white people can't do this. Chinese people, we're doomed. We're all on this thing together. We got to be one people together. And it's really simple to heal the earth. But you need the military, which is an odd thing for me to say. You take any swatch of Amazonia, 
the barrier reef, all these heavy duty places, and you put real guards on it, you know, all of these people go out and, you know, they come from San Francisco, New York with their drones and we've demarcated the land for the Indians. Why live there? And unless the Indians have weapons, big weapons, to protect those borders, it doesn't mean a speck of shit on a monkey's ass. It's bullshit, right? So, but if the military really protected for 10 years a part of a reef, a part of Amazonia, I guarantee you, unless it has a forever chemical or mer mercury in it that has to be taken out, it'll heal. Mother Nature will heal it all on herself beautifully mm. in 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Well, we, we kind of saw that, I think, with the pandemic, that when everything kind of shut down a little bit or a lot of things shut down, there seemed to nicer. be... Yeah, you know, it, the guy, you know, the earth started healing a little bit. And that you know, was beautiful. I, yeah, yeah. I remember, you know, I was living in uh, the Los Angeles area at the time, and it was remarkable that I, I always walked and I would hike a canyon every week. And all of a sudden, the air was clean and clear. <sighs> And LA had like the cleanest uh, air in the nation at, for like one week or something. And I remember there was that move to open everything back up. And I, there was a thunderstorm and we didn't get too many thunderstorms at that time, but I ran out to the front porch because I'm my grandfather's grandson. And whenever there's thunderstorm, I have to go out and see it. Um, you and I remember, you know, just standing there and, you know, watching the rain and listening. And then I could hear all the cars on the freeway. And I looked over and I saw pollution coming up again. And I thought, oh, we screwed up. We had the chance. <laughs> we had the chance. Um, I believe you. Yeah. I'm sad about that because I thought there was a moment. But those powers that be crushed that moment so quickly. Yeah. And also, too, everybody's so addicted mm. to this certain way of living and believing it's the only paradigm yeah. that exists. And that's another great illusion because the biggest difference, you know, I hear people come on and go, oh, you know, I went and lived with the Indians. I was there for two weeks and they saw me as special and taught me all their secrets. No, those people won't tell you a lick of truth until you know them a couple of years. They're not fools. They're smart at there. So all those people I just giggle at. But when you get to know them and get down with them, you realize they're literally here. The people who we've made the most worthless people, the people who now, why in the Jafari River Basin, and in the Alto Orinoco, Tapiripoco, Siapa Basin, where I was, are really, there's very scattered bands of uncontacted people still. But those are the two last enclaves of those people left. And why we're like, oh, we're so into ayahuasca and this and that, and oh, whoa, oh, oh. whoa. I've never seen one of these people put in a dollar to help any of those people or any time and all. And to me, you can't say, all indigenous or all Indian or all Native American people, because they're the same as every other people. There are great ones, jerky ones, stupid ones, smart ones, fat ones, skinny ones. They're people, people across the board or that. We don't really have races. We have found out in recent years that all our monkey butt ancestors were all sleeping with each other. And they murdered the whole race thing before the races ever started. Because we're funny. They were all screwing all over the place, these people, <laughs> whatever they were, these monkey people. And so we are one people, mm. but it serves the illusion to keep us bickering with each other because that's how you take the power away and that's something that I'm very much about. The practical aspect of the ghost dance mm. is to, without conflict, disintegrate the borders on a certain level because they, the, you know, there was that book, Guns, Guns, Steel, and Germs. I always right, do. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because anyone who ever lived in that world, that's a, that's what I call it armchair anthropologist because from reading other white men's books it looks that way but when you live in it it's not that way at all what the 
destroy the indigenous people is only two things, germs, 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 and borders, mm -hmm. dividing them, fighting them. That's all. We had superior guns. Those arabesque rifles were worthless in the new world. They had big, long wicks. They'd go out every two seconds. I took Yanomami once, really remote Yanomami, to see a horse because people said, oh, when the conquistadors came, they saw the horses and they were monsters and they bowed down to them. And I'm with these two Yanomami guys and they're looking at it and the first guy goes, that's the biggest deer I've ever seen. <laughs> what does it taste, right? <laughs> and I was like, that's, what, that's their eyes, how they see yeah. things. And I love that about them. And for all my negative in this year, years ago, people used to call me the Duke of Doom because I'd come back from the jungle and go, I'm at the end of the world. I'm watching it unravel. I spoke it. I've spoken a lot of places and to big, you know, I've been with the um, Inter-American Bank, the world, all over that stuff. I'm just entertainment for them. I know that it is kind of silly in a way because they, you know, back then they used to say to me, well, we believe you, but this isn't going to happen for 300 years, so don't worry. Then the same scientist said, well, we believe you, but it's not going to happen for 200 years. Then it became 50 years. Then it became 20 years. And why are we believing them when they're the same people not that long ago that gave us, when I went out there in the field, empirical knowledge, not reading other white men's books to come up with another version to sell a book of reprocessed crap, in my opinion, mm -hmm. right? I went and saw it firsthand, and that's not what was going on. You know, out there, you could see it for what it is. And because of that, I actually do have hope. I joke around. I'm no longer the Duke of Doom. I'm the <laughs> princess of hope, you know, um, because I don't believe, like John Lame Deer once said to me, the Lakota sage, who first mentioned the word, the ghost dance to me. He said um, at Tom Horn's grave, no, no politician or the scientist they pay to make their lies sound true is going to get us out of the trouble these Wasiku have gotten us into. Only the ghost dance can do that, but we have lost the steps. Hmm. And in some ways, you know, I was like, yeah, that's nice, but it did kind of send me on that version. And my hope is 100% in Kukikwe, Mother Nature. Yeah, I do not believe, hoping that they're going to get this, or what are these wacko tech guys who everybody goes to you? If you meet them, you will never, you will realize they're the smartest person. I've met a lot of smart people. When Francis Huxley, the great Francis Huxley, was dying, he cut, even in his biography, he cut himself off from the whole world except me, mm. right? So I've been around smart people when they were in the mood. To, he was still in the beads on Francis. He was on his deathbed, right? I've been around some pretty bright people. What I see is, mechanically advanced rats who have no social skills and now we have a bunch of mentally disturbed people running things in another part i don't believe i haven't heard them come up with one plan worth a speck of shit on a monkey's ass yeah well i don't think they want to because they benefit and profit from keeping everything the way it is you know they benefit and profit from keeping the illusion running yeah, hold, holding on to that illusion because now they got a lot of Toshkwa and they think, oh, well, Toshkwa is going to send me to the to some planet. Well, we believe. But I have a theory about that, too. I don't believe any of these jokers want to go to another planet. I think they want to go there on a vacation <laughs> and because what I've learned about those guys I've never been a Trekkie guy. I was in the jungle. I, I didn't watch any of that stuff until I was far into being an adult. But I did notice when I listened to those guys, every idea they have is out of an old Star Trek episode. Mm. People that was TV, not reality. Yeah, yeah. Space isn't filled with cute women with green skin and blue <laughs> dress. That's, you know. I mean, there aren't space wizards out there. Damn it. So, Damn it. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, I, I know that we're starting to run out of time a little bit, but I think this is important because this is one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you. And 
it's come up, but I want to ask you what you mean by the ghost dance, because there is this idea. I remember when I learned about it, it was like a, a revival, a messianic kind of revival in the 1890s. And you alluded to that, but also suggested that it's much, much earlier. And in the book, it comes across as being kind of Pan-American. So mm -hmm. what exactly is the ghost dance? Yeah, great point and great story. The fact is that part of the, the program of the powers that be was to reduce the ghost dance to idiocy, but then turn around and go, oh, but it's indigenous idiocy, so we can't say nothing about it. Well, let's protect that. The fact of the matter is that when Wavoka, the Paiute prophet, who learned the ghost dance from his father, the great rainmaker Tahil, it was very late. The native people were 98% on reservations already. Their soul there. You got to think of a people whose whole belief is respecting nature is the key to life. And other people come around and show the ultimate of disrespect and rape to her. And they seem to do way better than you. And then they hurt you. So it was a very confusing time, to say the least. And what happened to me was this. I first heard about the ghost dance from a Bruli Lakota named John Fire Lame Deer many years ago. And then years after that, I became friends with, with Henry and, and Leonard Crowdog, his son. And Leonard, their family lineage was actually who brought the ghost dance to the Lakota. So they had some interesting insight. And these people, they fell off the path they got on. But I've known them a long time. And they actually spent true time on the path. They really did. There were moments they were unbelievable. But then they put Leonard for ghost dancing at the wounded knee, whatever it was, military action, police action. And they put him in Leavenworth for four years, and they gave him hepatitis and sons of diseases. He got out of prison broken, right? And that's how they deal with holy men here. And then people go, well, maybe Lenin wasn't doing the right stuff. You go through that kind of horror, and let's see if you can stand up like Leonard did. That's what I say to people. No, the man stood, and, you know, he was human. But what happened to me was, it's the cover of my book. I was in the Alto Orinoco in the middle of the major epidemic of the 80s and 90s. And my favorite, my paradise village, Mavete, was falling apart. The people I love, my love of my life, my relations were dying in my arms. Many people died in my arms, holding them, swatting flies out of their eyes and nose for days. I was losing my mind, to be honest. And this woman collapsed on a river beach. And I had great doctors with me. I mean, these people, the, all I can say is as crazy as the men were, the women were even crazier. They were fantastic. And they yelled at me and they said, Miguel, you know, we got children dying, but you can't, she's gone, move on. But I'm not, a, I'm not that. I was like, oh my God, my heart's going to get torn out here. And, and two hours later, she stood up. And she started singing. She stood up, washed herself in dirt, just like Leonard Crow Dog did at Wounded Knee and with me and him alone, washed himself in earth, got up at Inyano Mami with the same intonation, sang the Crow Dog Ghost Dance song, which was Yapui We Sharika, give us back our arrows. Now, the U.S. government took that as a sign of violence, arrows against Gatling guns. I don't think so. And, you know, cannons. So that wasn't that, what the arrows really meant was give us back our manhood. In the in indigenous belief, every symbol has a male or symbol. The classic is the maraca. The gourd is the woman. The handle is the man. And the rattle seeds inside are the semen that create the childbirth of the ritual. And all. so I see this woman doing the exact same ghost dance as Lenny Crowdock in the heart of the 
Amazon. Then I worked for many years with H.P. Nicholson, and he taught me many things about the Codex Borgia. But once again, I say everything to me ever works out that way. I was at a Chili's in Southern Colorado with a friend of mine, and he laid out his new manuscript for the Museum of Mexico City of the Codex. And I turned the page and there was the God Lord of the Dead with his legs in a dancing in the classic, what they call the ghost dance step, back to back with the Joto, the young God of the wind, who in the underworld is transmutated into the plume serpent, Queso Oloto. And this was the first ghost dance. And if you can read the pictographs, they tell the story of that event and the birth of corn and how this ritual spread with the lay, with the grandmothers, with the Shamba, the clean sisterhood, spread through all the Americas as they took this amazing gift corn. And with them, they brought the story of the ghost dance with them to all the tribes. So in this day and age, there are not all, not this, but there are many tribes from the Amazon to Alaska that practice forms of the ghost dance. So I believe it's not the property of anybody, but it's inherent in the earth of America with the leadership of these people to bring us all together because no one's going to do it for us. We're going to have to get down and get our hands dirty and do it ourselves. And if you're sitting around hoping if these guys are going to do it for us or these mm. ladies, good luck, because I don't have a second belief they're going to come through. But I do believe in people. I do believe in the ghost dance and I do believe in mother nature. And I think they've got, you know, if I wanted to win a fight with you, a fist fight, I would convince you you lost before we ever started fighting. <laughs> that's how a real fighter fights, hmm. right? And that's what they're doing to us. They're yeah. convincing us we're so lost that without their ridiculous childish interpretations of old Star Trek episodes and their silly form of governing to destroy people that we should listen to them. Well, if I lied to you five times, would you believe me? They've lied to us 50,000 times. And we turn around and believe them again because we're too lazy to get out and do it ourselves. I happen to not be a lazy guy. I get out and do it. Yeah, wonderful. Well, you know, I, I have a quote here, which I think is a good place maybe to kind of end and I can ask you to comment on it, but I think this is a good summary of the ghost dance and your teaching here. And here's the quote, and this comes from your book, The Ghost Dance. Although many tribes had different styles of ghost dancing, the purpose was always the same, to commune with the ancestral ghost who knew the correct way to live. The ghost dance was a ritual of learning that could teach people to see through the illusion and commune with the forces of nature. By coming to terms with the gods, we could save our niche in the weave of nature. Very close, but I will admit that, as I say in the book, I truly believe that I am the pen hand of the book. But Dishi Tuk told me stories for many mm. years I recorded in journals, and they never made any sense. After 37 years, DC2 said, cut up all the journals on the floor and scramble them. And I realized that they were actually one story. But because DC2 knows nothing of human linear time, it wasn't linear that way. And I learned that DC2 actually lied to me and tricked me on one point of that. And he did it to protect me and protect him in this, which is there's two ancient dances. One's called the ancestor dance and once called the ghost dance. In the ancestor dance, you go to ancestral spirits. They may not be your grandparents or something, but they're ancestral spirits of humanity. Mm. In the ghost dance, there's no human spirit involved. It's the mm. spirit of the plume serpent, the Quetzalcoatl. The, uh, no one said it more beautiful than Mark Twain. It is that indomitable, 
wild and free spirit of the Americans mm -hmm. is a real thing. So when people come to me and go, teach me to ghost dance, I say, well, first of all, I'm not Arthur Murray and it's not the Mambo. So it's not <laughs> one, two, three, shuffle, one, two, three. And I said, two, if you want to learn the dance, I could possibly get you to a place where you could communicate with an ancestral ghost that would lead you to the spirit of mm. the plume serpent. Because the actual ghost dance is done with the spirit of the Americas. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. So like I said, I know that we're running out of time and uh, I could speak with you for a lot longer, I think. Uh, but let me ask you, what are you working on next? I got, actually, I got a lot. I mean, the first thing I'm working on, I live on a, on a rancho. So every day, <laughs> there's at least 15 things to fix. It's just the nature when you live on a ranch. So I take care of my ranch and I love taking care of my ranch. Working in the soil, digging, cutting wood, making things, grounds people more than anything. Mm -hmm. All this psychedelic, oh, we're working on after therapy. Go out and sniff flowers, dig a hole, make a adobe brick. Do this. Believe me, that'll be better than another neurotic person laying their neurotic rap on you for money. Mm. Just go and let nature be with it. One thing of my thing. Two is, I have a comic book coming out, which oh. is going to uncover so many things <laughs> that I think it's really, you know, because a comic book's wonderful. It's a comic book. You know, I say what I want to say in it. When I speak publicly, there's many things I can't say. Right. Have that I'm working on. I I was a, a star on a Hulu TV show a couple of years ago. So I'm being pitched right now, TV shows, episodial shows mm. about my, you know, like I always say to everyone, I have one story, but I know how to slice it. Many <laughs> the Amazon, the Moss, the Take of the Look, right, and right. it's all over the place. And, you know, actually, that's interesting with us. Usually I talk a lot about just living with the tribes and in the jungle. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about very important subjects. So I, I enjoy that, Nick, a lot because I've mm -hmm. got to say stuff I usually don't because mm -hmm. I usually just talk about that. Right. right. And I'm working on those projects, too, right now, because I believe that this is the time that that the ghost dance is coming to its fluorescence. And we have to try every tool in maze. And as where you started out, I believe the true gift I can give is giving people, I believe such as yourself, who really care and are really searching with these things, a very different way to look at it from a guy who didn't go down there for a week or two and come back with a story of how special he was that the Indians, oh, they came to me and oh, they told me their secrets because they thought I was such a special person. Yeah, you know, yeah. my thing is I've got, I've got 12 years of hard, deep bush time. That's a lot for any yeah. anthropologist or anything. And 90% of my life right now, I live right between three reservations. Yeah. So this is where I spend my life and all. And my knowledge is I read and I listen to other people, but my knowledge is very empirical and firsthand. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that's what I'm here to do is people. And I assure you this, you will never see me selling psychedelics in a commercial market to young people. No. Don't think that's, not that they shouldn't take it and all, but once you've got a commercial force, a machine pushing it, whoa, things are going to go very bad. And no. I think we're on the cusp. So I'm talk. I talked about you. I before I just didn't talk about that, but now I am. So for me, I just really see me. You know, I'm in an age. I'm in my seventies, where, you know, I'm not looking to get a Rolls Royce in a yacht, <laughs> bunch of chicks with plastic tits from LA and dance all day. You know, I mean, not my world. It's okay for someone else. Yeah, I don't want to be Justin Bieber. You know, and um, so I'm another way for people to look at it. And the truth is. 
there's so few people like me left, mm. you know, that really, you know, even like with the Mossad Tech, when I'm in the Mossad Tech and I'm there a lot, all the people go, if you want to find out about the old way, ask him. He was there with them all. We weren't even there, you know. So <laughs> my thing always was that I made a deal with Dishitu very early. And my deal was that I had to serve the indigenous people if I wanted to learn more of these secrets of the talking plants. And so instead of coming to the United States and spending everything to be whatever, I serve those people, the people I got it from. And I still do that. I, most of my ceremonial is among those people, but I do believe it's the moment now. And that's why I'm more in the public than before mm. with this stuff, because I really believe there's fantastic people out there of all colors, all dimensions of life and everything that when they hear empirical truth, not just someone writing in a book to make another book, to go up the academic scale or make money, but someone who is there, I think I have something to offer. Yeah. Well, I think you have a lot of wisdom and love the teachings and the insights that you have brought. And I am very, very grateful. But I, I have to ask before before I let you go, a couple of questions. One is because you've mentioned Dashito a few times, and I just wanted to be clear for the listener, who's Dashito? Well, it's it's actually it's hard to say news. It's called Dishito. Is the way you say. Okay. Yeah, it's a tricky thing because they have a a a tri like Asian language. They have that sing song tri ah. system, but they talk in a three tonal system different than us. So the translation. Actually, when I first got to the Masateka, and the true story of Maria Sabina, why the people burnt down her house and were made, and I knew Maria Sabina. I was with her when she was dying. My oldest friend, my best friend who died about a year or so ago, he was her first cousin. So I, met, you know, I, I did a ceremony with her, I don't know, almost 60 years ago. It was okay. But to the people of the Deep Forest, she was like a city chick talking to the white people. She was never a medit. She was never a TK or a Tanate to them. She was always an outsider. But Maria Sabina was an amazing lady too. You know, she, she was a very interesting person, very sad person. And what I realized was when I first got there, if you said the words of Dishito at all, you'd get killed. And my friend, Daniel, whose mother, was the Grand Chine of the whole region. Never in his life did he ever hear. That's how sacred that word was, right? Now, what I'm really talking about in the book is the voices, the spirits behind it. And those voices have names too, but I, because of taboo, cannot mention those names. Of course, I am devotedly superstitious and religious i'll admit it mm -hmm. i'm fundamentalist on this thing so dishitu actually means a very specific type of mushroom that is not a classic psilocybin mushroom which has a hallucinatory component it's an amazing thing just something different it only grows one place in the world of the many photographs and all that I've seen micrologists taken all they've never shown the tradition to and they won't right so it really is the sacred mushroom so if you go to Wotla which is the city of the Masateka where my dear friend Julieta the sacred grandmother was from and died I was sitting here in her kitchen the day she died with my wife drinking coffee that's to the people of the back mountains like i've met there's a woman who claims to be the queen of their french lady and this and that i don't know anybody there who knows and she's just she doesn't know two words of the life she doesn't know nothing it's just this wacko story she tells oh i go say i'm the queen they don't have a queen i mean it's just think but that's the economy of it. the people of the back forest never believe because there's, it's been Catholicism overrunning the belief system in Wodla for 150 years, 
right? Definitely since before the Mexican Revolution anyway. And so the true belief system lasted many, many years intact. And her and other people said, well, nobody knows the true belief because, you know, the church took it over. Well, that's because you don't read pre-Columbian pictographs. And that's because you don't live back there. That's because you never had relations back there. It's because you never knew the real Dishitu. When you go to Wotla, they will never give any outsider the true Dishitu. And even the great Gordon Watson, who I was personal friends with, he told the story that a couple of years later, he took psilocybin tablets from Albert Hoffman from Sandos to Maria Sabina, and she took them and said, oh, you know, this is the same thing as you had with the mushrooms. So the people from these organizations with all their drugs written on their shirts to insult indigenous people said, well, you see, Maria Sabina had it. Well, they didn't know Maria Sabina and they didn't talk to her. What Rambita actually said was the cubensis mushrooms that we grow here in the States a lot, which you took, which are wonderful. Yes, it is very similar to that. It has nothing to do with d though. Mm. Nothing. I talked to her about it and she laughed. She said, well, that's what, you know, they show pictures of her smoking a cigarette and everybody says it's a joy. Maria Sabina never smoked pot. She smoked cigarettes all the time. People have create these illusions mm. and convince. So people migrate to the Masateca. And I'm not saying, I have friends who've gone there and had mushrooms with my dear friend, Julieta, and they felt better. It helped them in all. But when you're talking about the sacred religion, straight to the ghost dance and how Dishitu relates to the ghost dance, and this is right in the codices, the images are there. When the plume servant, Ijoto, before he becomes a plume servant and dances with the Lord of the Dead, a specific bat bites him on the penis and he bleeds blood and semen. And from that blood and semen, the Yadisha two grows. Mm. Mm. Fascinating. And it's almost extinct. Mm. In the old days, when I first went there, I could never find them. After years of looking, I got where I could find bundles of them. Mm. I go up there now, me, the entire village, every medicine man and woman on that side of the mountain, sometimes we look for a month and a half to find them. They're almost extinct. Wow. which I think is a very scary thing and why everybody dresses up in their costumes and does their rituals. Why has not one of them had the insight to try to protect what is sacred in the Masateco or what is sacred in the Havari or sacred in, in the Siapa? You know, I did a lecture first time in 28 years I spoke in LA and this Danish lesbian lady said, well, you're part of the patriarchy. It should have been a woman there. I said, well, you know something? I was out there from 12 or 14 years fighting that epidemic. Didn't see any Danish lesbians. It could have been. <laughs> but I was out there alone, basically. You know, so fate had it. It was me. I don't know why that is. I'm hmm. not master of the universe. My life's a mystery to me. But yeah. I was there and I was a stand up enough guy after I almost died twice to go back twice and continue fighting. Mm. yeah so that's what my thing is i do it you know i i've done the dance i've been with more truly uncontact tribes and ritual i don't know anybody i know some socialist anthropologists from um, brazil who love to say oh the indians they want pants and tvs and radios just like everybody else they don't want to jump around silly with feathers and do this anymore you know i'm looking for the well, I would say a curse word, but I didn't say it. <laughs> you don't know these people. They don't give a damn about that stuff. Only when they're completely broken and they've sniffed gasoline and glue and seen naked white women at the rich treats and all, do they start thinking that way. When they're in their world, that thought don't cross their minds. And we don't realize that the people going there and doing this irresponsible thing is destroying their culture, the very culture that can save us all. Yeah. Yeah. That's a concern I have with things like ayahuasca. And I've 
heard that I've heard people say that some of the uh, shamans and Amazonians are happy that ayahuasca is coming out, but it seems to me that we've got, it's almost like another kind of colonization where people are going down and taking over and robbing the land again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and not to say, Hey, who can I say? Because digital ayahuasca, yopo, Pastor, these things shape my life. I'm a yeah. product of these things. So yeah. I'm not going to say that. And I also know this time in history, who the hell is going to run off like me for 30, 40 years? I mean, <laughs> God, right. yeah, what right, was right. I thinking? Yeah. You know, I, I get all that. I understand. I, I've, I'm a great grandpa. I care about the future generations, mm. my kids, my grandkids, my great grand. You know, I am other people's the native kids I love. I have adopted native kids out of mine. You know, I, I, I got a lot of heart for it and all, but, and not to say bring some economy or something to people. You know, I used to run a lot of stuff out of Akitos. I even had a radio show there for a while. And one day I spoke there in the Plaza de Arms and I said, you know, people, you don't get it. The rubber boom's over, the gacho's gone. The, this boom is over, that boom is over. What you have now is the draw of the native people and you do everything you can to marginalize them and just kind of flash them for a moment so people get the hit and go off on, oh, we're doing, you know, the new age is very creative on the good side. And then the other side, they just make stuff up out of their ear. You know, it's not, you know, and they say, well, why is your way better than mine? Well, after 58 years in the jungle and doing all this stuff, I think I got a little bit more background knowledge, you know, to look at it from. I am not an amateur, right? right? And and so I, I, I think that there's a real problem, like everything, what's happened with that. And to be honest, I know the big ayahuasca ashrams or retreats they have they're all run by white people they're all run by the biggest bullshitters in the world pachamama invented their whole thing that tribe they were with were conquered by were conquered and destroyed in 1954 you know very famous missionaries were with them and all and then the medicine man they brought out to me when I was down there, I knew him. He was the grandson of some kid I know who never spent a day in the jungle. He lived in the city. But when the ayahuasca thing started all, they painted him up and he grew his hair long. He don't know shit. You know, I mean, so people go, well, I know the the, the funky shamans in the United States and the shamanis, they're not real. So I'm going to go get the real thing. If your heart is real, it will bring you to the real thing. Mm. If you're just looking for the best party favor of the month, that's what it'll bring you to. You to. And I'd say at this point, 95% best party favor. There are people down there. I know medicine people down there who do good work and all, but sad to say, they're incredibly rare. Mm. And the crazy thing right now that's going on, which is really a scary thing, and it's been done by the, quote, environmental activist movement. And a huge problem is happening in the Javadi because of this is there was a point, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, where a group of women decided that the patriarchy and the men all did a bad deal since the American Indian movement and this and that the women were going to take over and do something. And as I say, I'm all into the grandmothers taking over. I got no problems with that at all. But what they did is they brought their belief systems from New York and San Francisco and Chicago and these places, and they brought them into these cultures that have their system. So what you have now is they came up with this woman who I see all over the internet, and she claims she has been an Iwakero for over 60, 65 years. Well, I will tell you a fact. The way people use ayahuasca in the jungle is not to become a bodhisattva. It's the survival of the tribe. Only there's no rock star shamans with man bonds. That's all silly mm. crap, right? 
So it's the tribe of what it's about. So when they take ayahuasca, and I took ayahuasca always until recently, they take it to commune with the elements of nature, know where the animals move, you know this. I took it because I learned early on that if the if I could not communicate with the ancestors, none of them would trust me and they'd kill me. Mm. So I learned the ceremonies and the plants so I could go to each tribe so they could see me and they know you can't fool them. They could see me do it. And that's how I could medically work with them. I won their confidence. So that's how I use the plants a little bit different, but they use it that same way too. So what they did, they went into these tribes, they set up this woman who doesn't exist. There was not a female ayahuasca, ayahuacero in the Amazon 65 years ago. I spent a lot of time in the jungle, never met one, nothing close. But now she's all over the web and they're saying, oh, we're bringing this thing. But what they've actually done the road into the Havari, which is into the, the strongest stronghold of uncontacted people there in the Siapa on earth. It's all young men from the Matsis, the Machiginga, and those tribes. Because they said to me, they said, these crazy women came out and destroyed our culture. Now men have no place in the culture anymore. So we're going to go work on the roads, make money, and go find women somewhere else. And these are the women running the environmental activist movement now. They used to be almost, most of them were my interns because the Amazonia Foundation was the very first. And I assure you, they know nothing about these people. They're just forcing their agenda and being very, they're colonists too. So there's a, as we're getting back to Nick, there's a lot of illusion involved. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and how do we break the illusion? I'm trying my best by talking to you, Nick. Yeah, you know, very like good. <laughs> guys like you and ladies like you. I've met plenty deep ladies and deep guys who are like, okay, you make sense. You've been there. We get it. And believe me, there, I've known some of the, my teacher, my original teacher was a woman. Hmm. She was a Tene, right? So I know there are fantastic women heels, some of the best I've known. But that doesn't mean they're ayahuacaros. That's just people inventing stuff to fit their purposes. Mm -hmm. Well, Michael, you have a lot of wisdom. You are a elder for the world, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. We all are. We all are. <laughs> But again, I thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolute delight speaking with you. And I know that we could uh, carry on this conversation for much longer, but you've had a long day and dinner comes uh, early here. So I'm going to wrap two. this up. <laughs> but let me ask you, where can people go to find out more about you and uh, your work? Well, I have an Instagram site, The Ghost Dance. And to be honest, I keep it up but I've really come to hate the people who run those things. <laughs> oh, I've been like, this, yeah. you know, I, I, I struggle with technology because I, I, I knew how to shoe a mule before I could ever mm. drive a car. Mm. Me and technology have not been a great match. I had my wife set this all up for me. I don't think we'd be talking <laughs> if it was in my hands. And I've got my websites, talkingplants.org. The, the Amazonia Foundation site is still up due to my dear friend Scott because it was really historic. It did something that no foundation did before that. So I'm very proud of it. And I've got my site, Michael Stewart on me. And, and I'm going to be around, you know, I'm, I've come out of the closet, so to speak. <laughs> and I'm going to now talk and be out there on a lot of stuff, partly because I am very knowledgeable and very inside information from that mainstream that has become what we're calling the commercialization and all. Yeah. People who have been at the meetings have said, I am absolutely blocked by those people. At mm -hmm. most of the events, I had the highest draw of anybody and they don't invite me at all anymore because mm -hmm. I don't suck up to their bullshit. Yeah. Right. They got an agenda and I'm a splinter and I will become a bigger thorn and splinter as it goes around. So what I'm saying is I'm going to be coming out with a lot of stuff out of what I call 
the new psychedelic underground because mm. those people are every bit the imperial colonists that have come before them. They have nothing to do with the underground anymore. And by them leaving that slot open with their silliness, it could be filled by more real people. And yeah. I think we could all be a part of that. And I really hope through people you know and I know and all, we don't let these people run with the football towards human destruction. We go, no, we're in, we're in for it. We're here to heal the earth and be part yeah. of her. And all and and we can grow an incredible underground that never sells out mm. to those imperial capitalistic colonial forces, which have been the key to the destruction of nature for the last 500 years. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, if I can be part of the underground, I'll be part of the underground, man. There you uh, go, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, again, Michael, thank you so much. I really appreciated this conversation and your time. It's an absolute delight. And hopefully we'll be able to speak again at some point. Love to speak with anytime. Give me a call, Nick. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you again so much. Ninachka Tachili, the gods give to the who give to the gods. And that's a wrap on episode 105 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience. Now, you know what's coming, all the usual, sign up for my Patreon, share this with friends and family and on social media, subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. You know the grind. Um, but here's the thing. All of this is really important. Putting together this podcast takes a lot of time. Right now, it's a labor of love. I'm in the process of making changes to improve the podcast and the YouTube channel and the website. It's slow going. Um, like I've said before, and like my dad used to say, it's like molasses in January. Your support will help me speed up the process and ensure that I can continue with the podcast and offer much more content than what I provide now. As I always say, I'm here in the front range doing missionary work in regards to religion, spirituality, and ecology psychedelics and consciousness and how all of this can help us heal humanity's relationship with a sacred earth. So if you feel moved by the rebel spirit and you know, I sure hope that you do, then please, by all means, help me in my efforts to share the good news. I'm Nick Mather and you've been listening to or watching rebel spirit radio until next time. May you be in peace. May you flourish in all possible ways. And may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.